Let's start off and discuss these intermolecular forces. These are going to be called dispersion forces, dipole-dipole attractions, and hydrogen bonding. Those are the forces that we usually associate with the transitions between solid to liquid to gas. And I think they are pretty universal throughout the galaxy. Let's actually define an intermolecular force. So we have an intramolecular force. That's actually the force created by a bond between atoms in a molecule. Intermolecular forces are actually the forces that create attraction between molecules that hold molecules together. So intermolecular forces are much, much weaker than the forces involved in intramolecular bonds. So they're weak forces, at least relative to bonds. These forces are electrical in origin, much like intramolecular forces, and they result from the mutual attraction of unlike charges, pluses and minuses. So let's look at the three different intermolecular forces that actually define whether a compound is a solid, liquid, or a gas. We have dipole-dipole forces. For example, if I look at this molecule, HCl, I actually have a partial negative charge on chlorine and a partial negative charge on hydrogen due to the differences in electronegativity. They're actually attracted to each other. We call these dipole-dipole because each of these molecules has a dipole that's set up. A partial positive charge, a positive, partial negative charge. Partial positive charge, partial negative charge. Another force that holds molecules together is called dispersion forces. That is actually a force between just all molecules. All molecules have this sort of attraction to each other. These again are also electrical in nature, meaning in this case, they have a temporary dipole that is set up as the electrons move throughout the molecule. If I have a partial negative charge on this side of the molecule, and at some instant in time, I have a partial positive on this molecule, they will be attracted to each other. And we'll talk more about that in the coming slides. The third type of force actually has the word bond in it, hydrogen bond, because that's, some scientists actually consider this a true bond because it's such a strong interaction. And hydrogen bonds are the attraction between molecules that have a very, very strong dipole moment. And it's specifically, it's between hydrogen and what we call a heteroatom. Heteroatom being either oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur. And those bonds are very strong. The forces are very strong. So we'll use that word interchangeably, either a hydrogen bond or a hydrogen force. Let's start by discussing the dipole-dipole forces in a little more detail. Those are just the result of the electrical interactions among dipoles of neighboring molecules. So for example, in this schematic drawing here, molecules that have a dipole moment, they have a partial positive and a partial negative charge. If we line those all up, the partial negatives are attracted to the partial positive. So there's a force holding them together. And these dipole-dipole interactions are much greater in liquids and solids than they are in gases. In an ideal gas, we sort of, sort of say that these don't exist at all. So polar molecules, ones in which there is a dipole, they attract each other so that by orienting their charges so that their the negatives are near the positives. We can sort of think of that as the uneven distribution of electrons to set up a dipole here, often associated with or actually quantified by electronegativity, setting up this dipole. And we represent these dipole-dipole interactions either by saying this delta plus, which means partial positive, and delta minus, which means partial negative. Or we could actually draw this sort of symbol, which represents the strength and direction of the dipole moment. In other words, 
how strong that dipole is relative to charge and distance between these two atoms. Let's just quickly review a little bit about dipole moments. Again, I could either represent this by delta minus or delta plus. For example, in this molecule, chloromethane, the carbon here would have a partial positive charge, the chlorine would have a partial negative. That's because the chlorine over here has a larger electronegativity than carbon. Another way to represent that is actually to draw this arrow here with this sort of cross at the bottom. This would be the positive side, this would be the negative side. So again, comparing those two dipoles, we can actually see that the dipole moments would favor chlorine in this case. If we look at that in sort of this electrostatic map here, you can see that we've drawn this with a red region implies partial negative. The sort of blue-green region signifies partial positive. There is an attraction between those. We call this an intermolecular electrostatic attraction between molecules with opposing dipoles facing each other. When we look at dipole moments and molecules, especially when we have complex molecules, we have two types of dipole moments. We have bond dipoles and we have total molecule dipoles. The total molecule dipole, in other words the net dipole for that molecule, is the vector sum of all the individual dipoles. So if we add up all these different dipole moments for bonds and take into account the direction of those, we get a dipole moment for the molecule. For ammonia, it has a dipole moment of 1.47 Dubois. For water, it has a dipole moment of 1.85. So water would have a larger dipole moment. It would be a more polar molecule. If we look at molecules which we consider nonpolar, they will still have dipole moments within them, the bond dipoles that have both a direction and a magnitude. However, when you add up the vector sum, for example, in this molecule of carbon dioxide, they sort of cancel each other out because they're in opposite directions. So this molecule is a nonpolar molecule. It has no dipole-dipole interactions between molecules. If I look at tetrachloromethane, which has four carbons on it, I know chlorine is larger electronegativity in carbon. However, because it's tetrahedral in nature, I add up the vector sum of all these individual dipole moments for the bonds between carbon and chlorine. The net dipole, mo dipole moment in this case would be zero for this molecule. It is considered a nonpolar molecule. Let's now look at the second type of intermolecular force that defines whether a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. We're going to call this London dispersion forces, or sometimes just called dispersion forces now. These forces are the result of shifting motion of electrons within a molecule, even a nonpolar molecule, and we call that polarizability. Think of this as a very short-lived dipole moment that can be set up when electrons move to one side of the molecule from the other side of the molecule. So it is an induced temporary dipole moment by, at relative to the neighboring molecules. We call these dispersion intermolecular attraction. So if I look at this molecule bromine, Br2, this would be a nonpolar molecule. However, if I could just shift electrons over to this side just for an instant, all of a sudden this side would have a partial negative charge and the other side would have a partial positive charge, which would influence the molecule next to it so it would attract electrons from this molecule over to this side and so forth. In other words, there's an intermolecular force between these two molecules that is temporary. So the larger the molecules, the more they interact with each other. 
So let's look at the molecule CH4, which again would be a nonpolar molecule. If we have, just for an instant, we have some of the electrons over on one side of the molecule, again, I'd have a partial negative charge, and I have a partial positive charge on the other side. An instant later, it might be evenly dispersed. And then I wait a little bit longer, the electrons can be over on this side of the molecule. And if I have other molecules of methane nearby, it will influence them. It needs to be noted that this type of force is present in every single molecule there is. It individually, they're weak, but become important in very large molecules. Again, size is important. How much surface area they see between molecules dictates how much force there is between these molecules. The following graphic illustrates the fact that these dispersion forces increase with contact area between molecules. If I look at these two molecules next to each other, this is a pentane molecule, so it's got five carbons and 12 hydrogens. There is a lot of contact area between these molecules here, so they tend to have a larger dispersion force between them, attracting them together. If I look at this molecule here, this is 2,2-dimethylpropane, it also has five carbons and 12 hydrogens, but it's more compact. There's less surface area, more less interaction between these two molecules. So in this case, the London dispersion forces are actually less. This can be illustrated by the boiling points. Because there are interactions between these molecules, it takes more energy to actually go from a liquid to a gas. So the boiling point is higher for this molecule than it is for this molecule. This one has less interactions, less forces holding them together. So it's easier to go from a liquid to a gas in this state. Let's now discuss the third type of intermolecular force that actually defines whether a substance is a solid, liquid, or gas. That is hydrogen bonding. That is the attractive force between a hydrogen atom that is bonded to a very electronegative atom, either oxygen or nitrogen are two examples of that. And that force or that attraction is to another atom in a molecule that is electron rich. In other words, it actually has a lone pair of electrons. That could either be in the same molecule or in a different molecule. An example of that would be water, where I have hydrogens and I have a very electron-rich oxygen in another molecule of water. This oxygen it has a partial negative charge, not only because it's electronegative and it's pulling electron density away from hydrogen, but it's also got these lone pairs out here. In another molecule of water, because the oxygen is pulling electron density away from hydrogen, I have a partial positive charge in it, and I can actually have an electrostatic interaction between the lone pair of electrons and oxygen and the hydrogen on another molecule. And that's why people tend to call this actually a bond, because I'm actually attracted to those negative electrons here. So water and water have very, very strong hydrogen bonding forces between them, holding them together. Another example is ammonia, where nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. It's electronegative, so it has a partial negative charge on it. On another molecule of ammonia, because I'm pulling electron density away from the hydrogen, that hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. There's going to be an attraction between the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen and that partial positive charge on the hydrogen, forming what we know as a hydrogen bond. So ammonia also has very strong hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is considered to be the strongest of the three types of intermolecular forces. One reason for that is that we're actually using a lone pair of electrons being attracted to hydrogen, but also because in the case, for example, of water here, this hydrogen here can hydrogen bond to an oxygen. 
this oxygen can hydrogen bond to another hydrogen on another molecule of water. So liquid water contains sort of this vast three-dimensional network of hydrogen bonds that result from the attraction of the positively polarized hydrogens and the electron pairs on the negatively polarized oxygens. And if we look at this graphic here, you can see each oxygen atom has at least two hydrogen bonds and several of them actually have more. This actually accounts for the very high boiling point that water has relative to its size. Water is a very small molecule, but it still has a very high boiling point. Hydrogen bonding can occur not only in molecules that are the same in chemical structure, but they can also occur between molecules that are different. Here's an illustration. If I look at water, water hydrogen bonds to water as represented by these black dots. If I look at methanol, methanol contains an oxygen. That oxygen has a hydrogen attached to it. That oxygen also has a lone pair of electrons. So it can actually hydrogen bond to near neighbors of methanol. When I mix methanol with water, I can actually hydrogen bond now between water and methanol, as illustrated here. Here's a water molecule. It's hydrogen bonding to this methanol molecule. This methanol molecule is hydrogen bonding to that water molecule. This methanol molecule is hydrogen bonding to this water molecule. When we mix these two together, we call this solvation. So whenever we have hydrogen bonding, two different molecules that actually can hydrogen bond, they usually are miscible, meaning they can mix together, and they form a hony, homogeneous mixture, which we call solvation, the process we call solvation. Let's compare the strength of these three intermolecular forces. If I look at dispersion forces, that's the temporary attraction between dipoles, that strength is about one to three kilojoules per mole. If we look at dipole-dipole attractions, that's typically between three and 10 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen bonding is somewhere between 10 and 40 kilojoules per mole. So hydrogen bonding is the strongest, followed by dipole-dipole, followed by the weakest, which will be our dispersion forces. If we compare all three of those now to covalent bonds or to ionic bonds, they're much, much weaker. Covalent bonds and ionic bonds range somewhere between 100 and 900 kilojoules per mole. So you can see here that these intermolecular forces are weak enough that they can be easily broken by just either increasing the temperature or changing the pressure. In addition to determining whether a substance is a solid, liquid, or a gas, intermolecular forces, like hydrogen bonding, play an important role in actually the genetic makeup of all living organisms. If we look at DNA, for example, DNA is a double strand. In that strand, those are held together by these hydrogen bonds between the different nucleotides, which are guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine. And they're held together just by hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are strong enough in most circumstances to actually hold that double helix together. However, when a cell is either ready to duplicate or it's ready to be transcribed into RNA, it is easy to start breaking up those hydrogen bonds so we can start to replicate or duplicate the DNA.